Welcome to the Bobcast, talking to all of our in-season spring head coaches. We begin today with men's and women's, women's tennis coach, Coach Aaron Wilf, and tennis went on its spring break trip. The women took on Virginia Wesleyan on Thursday evening. Both teams played conference foe Southern Virginia on Friday night, and then they played nationally ranked Christopher Newport on Saturday. Uh, the lone win of the, se of the week was Jenna Lipinski at number two singles against Southern Virginia. Um, so let's start right there. What did you see from, from Jenna over the break and then specifically in that win against Southern Virginia that you liked? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I honestly thought both teams played really well against Southern Virginia. Um, it, it was it was a really good showing, I thought, for us individually with a lot of our players. Jenna was phenomenal at uh, number two singles for us against Southern Virginia. She just was so consistent that day. Uh, she was a wall. She had a solid win, 6'4", 6'3", and uh, she, she really just kind of, uh, you know, made her opponent play her style, and, and I think any time you can do that, um, it's really a good sign for your player and your team. So, uh, yeah, great win by Jenna, but really everyone played well against Southern Virginia. Uh, we showed up that day, and uh, just as a coach, it was really good to see. As a whole, how, how was the trip, and then what stood out for you outside of that win, both sides? Yeah, it was it was a pretty quick trip. We were slated to leave campus on Wednesday due to some weather conditions. The Lots of storm. snow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, there were some weather conditions that prevented us from leaving on Wednesday, so we ended up leaving on Thursday. Um, and we actually played uh, Virginia Wesleyan Thursday at 5 p.m. Now, we didn't get down to Virginia Wesleyan until – it was between 4.30 and 4.45 that day. So, so hop it, off the bus, and there you go. Li literally, literally. <laughs> we were sitting in the parking lot. We were scrambling. We were getting tennis rackets. We were, you know, making sure we were getting, you know, had our shoes on, and we literally sprinted out to the courts for warm-ups, and, and we just kind of had to do that. There was a lot of traffic on the road going down. So it, it was a rush, rush kind of day for us on Thursday. Um, again, not, not what we anticipated, but uh, you got to do what you got to do. We and, uh, went down there. It was a beautiful school, beautiful facility. Um, we had the women's match against Virginia Wesleyan. And, uh, yeah, that was step one of the trip. Step one of the trip. And then the conference play on Friday and Saturday. What's, what's the benefit of it? it it's hard to frame it, you know, when, when you have, you're competing with some really strong schools. What's the benefit of having such tough competition within your own conference and seeing some of those top-tier teams, especially early in the season? Short answer is it makes you better. I mean, I, I, I think any time as an athlete, as a competitor, if you go up against someone that's, uh, you know, that's either nationally ranked or close to nationally ranked, it, it certainly makes you step up your game. It makes you better as an athlete, as a competitor, and I, I think that's what happened this weekend. Southern Virginia, uh, we were very impressed with them. They added uh, a lot of pieces to the puzzle this year. They, they really brought in some pretty solid freshmen, and uh, it made them a lot deeper. Um, so very, very impressed with Southern Virginia. And Christopher Newport's always very tough on the men's side. They're defending CAC conference champions, mm -hmm. so uh, – you know, r really, really strong showing from them, um, and in the women's side as well. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, it, it was a tough weekend. It was a challenging weekend. I think it made us better. I was really proud of the effort that our players showed on the court. Um, they really came to play. I mean, Friday, Saturday, we we really had a good effort from our tennis players. Could have been happier, and uh, it's it's definitely a building block, and and we're going to use it to uh, take the next step forward. I'm really interested in, in some sports, tennis, uh, track and field, swimming and diving, the mental side of things. Um, for example, uh, Kate Pal Paylor is, is your number one singles player, and she, game after or match after match after match, has to match up with other opposing top players. Now, she's, she's the number one player in your team, but her record isn't great. How do you keep uh, – not, it's not necessarily about her, but how do you keep your players engaged – when they're asked to, to step up and take these roles uh, on your team and there's not a lot of success on an outward sense. Uh, what, what's that mental like and, and how do you coach around that? Well, Kate specifically is a competitor. I mean, she, sure. she's just someone that hates to lose. She uh, she, she takes every loss, um, I, I think, very, very well because she it motivates her to get better. I mean, she has that hunger and that will to want to compete. She's always looking forward. You know, if, if she doesn't have success one day, she's, okay, what, what have I learned? What can I do the next day to have success against the next opponent? So I, I think she deals with it very well. I've, I've seen tennis players, not, not so much here at this school, but – 
yeah, I mean, if they continue to lose, it, it gets frustrating, and, uh, you know, it may not make them, you know, elevate their game. It may do the opposite. But I, I think we're very blessed, very fortunate here that we have players that they use that as motivation, as hunger to keep getting better. I think she does that very well, and I think all of our student athletes do that incredibly well here. You have you have gone through the process before of of building a successful program um, in in your past with with LaRoche College, and uh, it it takes time and it takes patience. How hard is that for for players to understand, even in in the moment, that this is all part of a process and it's tried and true and it works and there are challenges and it's a tough conference and we've been inside a lot of time. How, how do you relay that um, to your team and just stick to the program because you've gotten those results? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think a lot of times it's it's a matter of sometimes just setting different kinds of goals. I sure. mean, I, I don't think we we, we go in and we say, uh, you know, we, we, we're going to go into a nationally ranked team like Christopher Newport and, and we're going to come out of there with a 9-0 win. We're going we're gonna to sweep through singles. We're going to sweep through doubles. They're, they're not going to know what hit them. I, I don't think it's that kind of mentality. Um, a lot of times it's, it's smaller goals, it's simple goals. Uh, for example, last year, collectively, we won a total of seven games uh, against Christopher Newport when you combine the men and the women. This year was 18. So we actually we actually more than doubled our individual game win total from last year to this year. And I think that's kind of an example of some of the smaller goals that we set. And, you know, it, it definitely feels really good when you go out there and you actually accomplish those goals. And I think that's something that motivates you. In a lot of ways, I thought Newport was better this year than they were last year. So to come away with more than double the amount of indiv individual games won, I think is a small victory for us. And that's how I think we kind of keep the drive, keep the hunger, keep the motivation. And, and that's what kind of inspires our student athletes to keep working hard and getting better. Absolutely. Did the spring break trip help in terms of, of chemistry, bonding um, for, for both of your men's and women's teams? Yeah, we, we definitely saw a lot of bonding. Um, it's it's just fun to kind of, you know, be with the team for, for three days. And, you know, again, it wasn't a long trip. It, it had a much different feel than it did last year. Uh, weather w wasn't as good as it was last year, so I, I think that was a challenge as well. But, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's fun. There was, I think, t 24, 25 of us on this trip, and uh, you're hanging out, you're – um, hanging out in the hotel, you're getting pizza, you're going out to dinner, you're just, um, yeah, you're just always around the, the, the student athletes 24 seven. So yeah, it definitely brought us closer together. Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we got to see two of the better teams in the conference. Yeah. And, uh, like I said, everyone played well as coaches. We're very proud of the effort. We just need to stay hungry. We need to keep getting better and, uh, we need to have another very good week of practice this week. How, how how excited are you to get out of this snow and how how much improvement can you see over the course of even just a month when you have consistent practice time outside? Yeah, well, we're 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 still waiting on that, so I'll definitely let you know as soon as, <laughs> yeah. as, 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 soon as we have that. But uh, yeah, it's it's a challenge for us. I think kind of going into the gym, going outside, it's. It's really not ideal, I, I think, for any tennis team to have to do that. The surfaces play much different uh, when you're inside and when you're outside. And kind of going back and forth, like I said, pre presents challenges for us. Hopefully the weather's going to get better. It's going to allow us a lot more days outside. I know we'll be outside today. We're, we're, we are seeing a lot of rain this week, which is probably going to put us back inside. But uh, there's, there's not a whole lot we can do about that. We just have to... Uh, you know, say it is what it is, and uh, wherever we are, outside, inside, we're just going to keep working hard, and uh, let's just uh, do the best we can do. It is what it is. Finally, this week, Hood College on Saturday here. It was a win for the women last season, a loss for the men. What are you looking for out of your teams uh, on game day? Um, I'm honestly looking for more of the same. I, I really think the match against Southern Virginia this weekend showed us something. It, it just, it, it was a really good effort. Um, I thought for the men and for the women, everyone played well. Uh, we we just looked like a team that wanted to be there, that wanted to compete, that wanted to excel on the tennis court. That's why I was so happy with this weekend. I mean, it was just, it was a, it was a group of student athletes that truly wanted to be there. Um, like you said, last year against Hood, uh, women played really well, got a, got a significant win for us. Uh, you know, men had a tough loss. Hopefully we can get two wins this weekend. And, uh, but it really comes down to, you know, showing the effort, still having the hunger. And I think if we have that moving forward, then we're going to continue to get better. Well, we're looking forward to it. Hood College on Saturday. It'll be here. Uh, Coach Aaron Wolf, thank you for joining us in the Bobcast.
Back on the Bobcast, I'm here with head softball coach Wes Landrum, and softball finished up its spring break trip with a doubleheader with Salem College. Won the first game 4-3, lost the second game 5-3. And uh, FSU on its trips, they've been very good this year, 5-1 and in totality over spring break's Myrtle trip, 4-0 and in Virginia Beach. So here we go. Frostburg softball played Salem on the first day of the season and lost 10 to nothing. Coach, can you point to areas of growth where you, you saw your team develop through the season from that first day to the doubleheader split where you won a game and very nearly could have won the second game as well? Yeah, I mean, I think the hardest part for for us getting outside is, is the main key in, in getting the ability for spatial awareness. And I think day one for us, uh, weather wasn't great when we played Salem. It was it was rainy. It was cold. It was kind of a miserable day, and we played like it. Um, I, I think the team you saw a month later is, is more indicative of who we are. Um, but a lot of that is just being able to get outside and play and learn each other, and be comfortable and confident in what we're doing. And in both trips, you know, five and one, four and zero. Oh good weather or better weather than what we've had here in Frostburg. How has that those two trips and being able to play outside really changed or increased the confidence or swagger of this Frostburg softball team as we move towards conference play? You know, I think it's twofold. First one is success. Obviously with success you breed more success when you see yourself being successful, whether it's offensively or defensively. Um, for us, more defensively than anything. Um, we can hit every day inside. We don't always have the facilities to, to play defense inside. The way our weather's been this year has been not very conducive to us getting outside. Mm -hmm. So so the defensive aspect of it has been behind the rest of us. So I think, you know, being able to play on a regular basis has helped. So, I mean, I think us seeing success has, has really built up our inner mojo. And, and would you say swagger for the softball team? Um, if you want to say swagger, feel I free will to say swagger. I will. Uh, the the two games, some some interesting storylines out of each. Uh, you win game one where you allow just three runs, and Salem ends up stranding twelve base runners. Five of seven innings, Salem left at least two runners on. What does that say about Allison Short, who you had in the circle, and your defense with uh, four first years out there? <laughs> um, you, you know, she didn't. She wasn't. She didn't have her best stuff. Um, but I think that goes to show you know, the competitive nature of her and being able to get out of predicaments and being able to just grind it out. Um, it, it was it was a fun game to see her perform. Um, that's the most pitches she's ever thrown in a game, I believe, for us. And so it was, uh, it, it was, it was neat to see us just being able to, to face adversity almost every inning and just sort of, you know, squeak out. She was able to get it done. She's been a veteran for your squad. Kind of a, a flip side situation where, you know, it, the situation became a little too much. The, the seventh inning of game two, you're up 3-1, two outs, hit by pitch, walk, error, two-run single. Salem ends up getting four runs and, and winning the game. Your team will face adversity like that sooner or later, and it might not always be short the one who can handle that. Um, she wasn't pitching in that game. How can your team as a whole learn from, from situations like game two? Yeah, I think those are all great learning experiences. You know, with a young team, it's it's about being able to have a, different kinds of experience, good and bad. A lot of times the best way to learn is to have a bad experience. Um, it, it stunk that that was the last moment of our spring break trip that we end up giving up four runs on the top of the seven. Caitlin pitched a, a wonderful game yeah. leading up to that point. It allows us, hopefully, to grow and to um, to understand that, you know, every out is important offensively and every out is important defensively. Um, you know, it, it's it's 21 outs to get us out of a game, and it doesn't matter if it's the first inning or seventh inning. Those innings can happen at any point in time. It, it's more of us the ability to sort of, you know, keep our mental focus and, and make sure that we're making the plays we need to make um, overall. First year, Taylor McCarty had a, a two-out single, a two-run single in game two. Another moment that jumps out to me where a young player comes through for you guys. I don't know too many teams that their middle of the lineup is all underclassmen, where you've got Ramey, Merling, McCarty at, at three, four, five, like you did in the doubleheader on Tuesday. You're, you're, they're your three leaders and, and runs batted in. How have they really grown into those roles in the lineup as, as the season has gone on? 
you know, it's a process, really. Um, they've done a fantastic job of, of finding success. Sometimes I think they're a little overwhelmed with the situation they're in, and, and that's where we try to dial it back a little bit and make sure that they understand that they don't need to do everything themselves. Um, you know, it wasn't my intention to have three new people hit three, four, and five necessarily in the order, but that's just the way it's kind of worked mm -hmm. out. So it's, it's um, you know, we've had some success with it. Will that be the way moving forward? Maybe, maybe not. But at the end of the day, it's just about them, you know, understanding that their role doesn't change no matter where they are in the batting order. It's just about trying to make quality at-bats every time. And they put up the numbers thus far. Ramey isn't listed as a catcher, wasn't in the, the starting lineup in the first day of the season. How has she made her way into that spot, at least on Tuesday? You know, I mean, I think uh, she, she's done a really good job back there um, in practice. And I think that, you know, obviously we need to find a way for her to get her bat on the field. So it, it's a sort of uh, been a good marriage so far. And then Frostburg was picked third in the conference despite all of the, the unknowns, a lot of respect from, from the other coaches to the program that you have. And despite this team being a lot of new faces, other teams are still gunning for you. You know, this conference, it's seven days you play doubleheaders over the course of four weeks. How do you feel about this, this group in terms of taking on that gauntlet? Um, contrast how you, you projected your team before spring break or the two trips and now after the trips where you are. <laughs> I mean, record-wise, it's a lot better. Yes. Um, but it, it's not – it was never doom and gloom for me. Um, you know, I think w when you play some tough games early on in the season, there's a purpose to that. It, it's hard for us to, to make corrections to what we need to make corrections to because of our locale and weather. So uh -huh. so we know we're going to be behind the eight ball a little bit. A as far as the conference goes, I mean, I think we're 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 growing like we need to grow. I, I'm not happy with where we're at, but I'm a lot happy with where we're at a month after the season has started, for sure. We're a lot more fun to watch. Um, I would think if you ask our fans that, they would gladly tell you that. Um, the first day was, was, was kind of a day of reckoning for us, and so I think you know it's, it's nice to go out and watch the kids have success and feel comfortable and calm and, and, and go out and make plays offensively, defensively, and pitching wise. Finally, this week, uh, Bridgewater is scheduled home on Friday at York College to begin conference play on Saturday. York was picked right behind you guys in the CAC preseason poll. Two wins for Frostburg over York last season. Uh, do you – hopefully we, we get these games in, but what what do you expect as the beginning of conference play with York College and yeah. maybe Bridgewater? Sure, I think York's been a fantastic team the last couple of years. Um, they've, they've gotten a lot better under Coach Pettis, and I think that, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's always good competition for us and – you know, I think that we, we've got to play well to win these conference games. Well, best of luck to you, Coach. Wes Landrum, thank you for joining us on the Bobcast. Thank you, Andy. Back on the Bobcast here with men's lacrosse head coach Tommy Pierce. Men's lacrosse, Scott, its conference journey started with uh, Christopher Newport University, nationally ranked CNU, number 18 in the country, a 13-7 to loss after the Mary Washington game was snowed out and moved to this coming Thursday. And, and Coach, Falling behind a little bit early, 2 nothing. The, the game was tied at halftime, and then CNU outscores Frostburg 9-3 to over the course of the second half. What can you point to that, that went well in the first half, and then what can you point to that allowed CNU to sort of break away in the second? Uh, I think largely that was face-offs. You know, early, early in the game we were doing a pretty good job. Uh, their their face-off guy actually jumped the whistle a couple times, so we won a couple, and we were doing a pretty good job of getting them tied up and, and letting the wings get involved, but I think they won – eight of nine in the fourth quarter when they really started mm -hmm. to pull away. So, you know, when we needed to be getting some possessions there, uh, you know, we weren't. Um, I, I think we actually scored seven goals on 18 shots, so we weren't doing too bad on the offensive end of the field. Uh, but we also had um, – I think they they statted us being 11 of 12 on clears, but that that wasn't right. We definitely failed some clears. So on top of being a little bit behind uh, in possession numbers from the faceoff, we failed a few clears too, and I think that uh, let, allowed them to pull away at the end. You know, a couple of those goals at the end, we were coming out and trying to force some turnovers, and we gave them some easy opportunities t towards the end. Um, but, you know, I think close through three quarters, and then it got away from us at the end. Sure, and this is this has been a little bit of a theme of, of this men's lax squad where you saw hanging with, with Franklin and Marshall for a quarter, with, with Cabrini into the second quarter. Uh, in, in other games we've seen it. What If you can, can get your consistency throughout the course of a game, 
is your team talented enough to play with and, and get a couple of those wins against those top t- top tier teams? I think we need to be more consistent, clear in the ball for sure. Um, yeah, we're, we're we're not percentage wise where we want to be there, you know. And when we go back and look at the film, a lot of times it's just you know dropping some passes or, or throwing some away. So um, you know, a little bit disappointing. I think it's just just. You know, hopefully that we were kind of hoping those mistakes would would start to disappear a little bit as we, as we you know got further along in the season, but they're still kind of hampering us a little bit. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I think uh, I think we're there. I think we're close. You know, we're, we're trying to figure it out on, on offense a little bit still and and uh, control our turnovers. You know, but I think you know, it, 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 we think we're really really close, and that's what we keep telling the guys. If we keep working and, and paying attention to detail, then then hopefully we'll start turning some of these scores our way here. And as you've said again and again, that the key is April twenty eighth. Right. or whatever that date is, getting to the conference tournament and making some noise in there. Uh, a big storyline this season has, has been offensive patience. How was that on, on Saturday? And, and you took this spring break week. You had the whole week to, to practice. How was that practiced? Uh, we were inside. It was practice. That was inside. tough. Yeah. Uh, we, we got a great day outside Monday. I think it was 55 degrees. And then uh, and we got a lot of snow that next night. It was kind yeah. of crazy how, how fast the temperature dropped and we, it snowed a lot. So, uh, you know, we did get to focus a lot on our six on six. I think, like I said, I think our six on six offense was sure. Okay. On Saturday, definitely room for improvement. Um, but it's been worse this year too. Um, but again, you know, I, I think if we'd had a few more possessions from uh, not not failing some of those clears and, and maybe winning a few more faceoffs, that that could have been the difference. But like I said, that fourth quarter when they won eight of nine faceoffs, that's that's certainly tough to overcome. And and they, they do a good job on offense, you know, possessing and um, you know working for good shots. Are you guys still battling injury in that that second midfield line? And how does that impact what you want to do both sides of the ball? Uh, we, we got Quinn Western back. You know, he obviously he's torn his PCL, so he's playing with a knee brace. Um, Ryan Balkages was actually cleared for practice on Friday following uh, his concussion protocol. Um, so it's, it was tough to kind of throw him in there Saturday after, you know, one practice on Friday. Um, so, you know, I think we're getting some depth back and hopefully we'll keep improving in the midfield. Um, you know, that's the plan. Uh, good things. 13 of 18 shots were shots on goal. The, the clear numbers were good, but not exactly accurate. Limited right. turnovers in the second half. What, what did you like? What's, what's good to take away from this CNU game? Uh, like I said, I, th- I think you know, we, we generated some good opportunities on offense, and I think we even kind of generated some opportunities that we we didn't really dodge hard on the backside that I think were better opportunities than, than maybe th- we, we realized w- when we caught the ball on the backside, um, you know, after we draw a slide and, and, and push it and have a little time on the backside. So I think we're, I think we're getting there. You know, I, I think, um, like I said, that the, sh- the shooting percentage and the shooting on goal was good, but we just didn't have enough shots. So I think mm-hmm. that comes down to possessions, and you know when we do get a possession, making sure we generate a good shot. We had a couple, you know, catching and throwing turnovers early um, in the first quarter, one early in the second quarter. Um, so I think there was there was you know three or four turnovers early where I thought maybe we could have even taken a lead by a goal or two early in the game. There haven't been too many games this year where we can really point to, hey, they had way more chances because of faceoffs. This is one of the few times where, where the other team kind of dominated that circle. How do you see uh, Matt Pagliaro, Drew Mash sort of coming back from this and, and advancing? It's, it's We have a similar challenge on Thursday. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Eli Ayer for, for Mary Washington, is, is you know, he, he gave us fits last year uh, with Kyle Horak. And, you know, we lost to them twice last year by a close margin. And I think uh, – you know, probably the faceoffs were the biggest reason why. So, um, you know, it doesn't get any easier uh, on Thursday. Um, you know, and I think you know Tony Cruz and and uh, uh, in Eli Air, I think two of the better faceoff guys in the conference this year. Maybe, you know, maybe in Division Three lacrosse in the South. Um, so, you know, we're going to keep fighting from the wings. You know, hopefully Mike Thorne can keep coming along. He's got pretty quick hands, but um, you know, beyond the faceoffs. Right now, it's a little bit of an adventure with him, so we're, we're trying to work a lot in, in practice to get him a little bit more comfortable beyond the faceoff. And um, you know, but Matt, Matty's scrapping, and, and, and Drew's a good change of pace when he gets out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to keep keep working at the faceoff, keep working from the wings to get to where you want to get. April twenty eighth, that conference tournament, uh, mm-hmm. top six finishes required to get a home game. You most likely needs to need to get a win over one of Salisbury, York, Mary Wash, and and the wins against other teams aren't aren't automatic either. This is a, a brutal conference. So what what kind of progress? How much progress needs to be made? And how important is this Mary Washington game on Thursday? Mary Washington is a big one. You know, I think last year. Um, 
the we were five and they were four so we had to travel to them mm-hmm. you know what i mean and i think it, with how spread out our our conference is geographically that makes a difference it, it's a big deal you know getting off a bus on a wednesday versus uh you know kind of going to your home field on a wednesday uh in those early rounds is huge so there's definitely a lot on the line i think mary washington's a good team you know they had a close game with um uh st mary's on saturday you know and we, we've played a couple of the same teams and we've got some comparable scores so i think it's going to be a, a, another you know, close matchup here so we're watching men's lacrosse very closely coach tommy pierce thank you so much for your time thank you back on the bobcast we've got women's lacrosse head coach haley weir uh, a win in Ho- hilton head south carolina against hope 19 to 15 a loss in the the cac opener to christopher newport that was a sunday game 22 to 8 and, uh, Coach, I want to start with the Hope game, the second highest scoring game of the season so far for your team. What can you point to that went right, especially offensively, in that win early in the week? Um, I think a lot of the positives that came out of that game were that, one, being away on spring break is sometimes just nice to kind of get out of your element and to try some different things. Um, we had everyone play in that game, which was exciting for us that we could see some other opportunities. So Tara Whitney having her first goal, um, that was exciting to kind of have that opportunity to throw that out there. So I think just really having everyone mesh together at practice and then being able to put that into a game with every single player on the field um, really worked for us offensively that day. 11 of your 22 goals came from Morgan Cavey and Jerem Matlick. Is your offense designed to, to maximize those players in particular, and, and how have they been able to generate their production this year? They're not um, solely – around them. Um, Morgan, I think, just has that drive because she's a junior now and she knows what she's doing and she's very confident out there on the field. So I don't think she's scared to take any 1v1s um, and she sees some opportunities that some new players maybe don't. Um, Jara is a threat because she works behind the cage a lot in that X spot. And so she has the opportunity to see a lot of um, things from that angle. And sometimes it'll help her realize if she could take the ball or not. Um, But I think that she runs a lot of stuff from behind and so that gives her a lot more opportunities to say okay this is a great time to do this or maybe not let's hold back for a little bit and kind of see our other options going into the cnu game you had three top 10 goal scorers and kv leading the conference in goals jira matlick top six molly biggers number 10 what has made this offense as a whole so effective so far this season Um, I don't know if there's one thing in particular that has stood out. I think that having that leadership from Morgan out there has been a huge help. I think that having some consistent players like Molly Biggers and Courtney Ridenauer and um, players that have had that opportunity to have some um, more experience has really helped to try to say now it's my time and now it's my time to step up. And I think that's really helped. And then being able to kind of move these freshmen into a couple of our games now and get them comfortable has really set the tone for everyone does have a major role and we do depend on everyone and um, we need everyone to kind of step up at different times. And so I think having that has made them a little bit more comfortable and able to realize what a difference they do make on our attacking end. Uh, The offense second in the CAC and scoring offense assists shots, shots, Shots on goal, so that they've had a great year. Uh, on the other side, against CNU, three of your def- defensive starters, Adams, Bilbrey, and, and Coffee, were all freshmen. Uh, how did they work their way into the lineup, and, and how have they grown and, and sort of developed into the college game? Um, Mackenzie is actually a sophomore. Oh, sorry, underclassman. Nope, that's okay. Yep. yep, underclassman. And um, she has really stepped up this year. I think last year we tried to put her in some roles down there, and it just was a little hesitation and not exactly what we were looking for at the time. And we had a lot of conversations with her throughout the season last year and over the fall, and I think she's taken it to heart, and I think she's stepped up significantly for us this year. Um, so we are really excited to have some consistency back there with her. Um, and then Bilby and, Bilbrey and Coffee, we have a lot of new freshmen um, with all 10 of them and so just kind of getting them used to the speed change so our out of conference play is never as um, high intensity as our in conference play Um, and we try to prepare for that but again Christopher Newport they have a lot of fast speed and I think you can't really prepare for that 100% and they kind of have to just go out there and see what they come up with so I think yesterday was eye opening for them and I think that now we really know um, where some weak spots are and what we need to do and I think that just having that game under our belt will really help as we move through the CAC. The, the first half of the CNU game, uh, really competitive. The, the pace of the game varied where 
it was go, 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 go back and forth, really, for the first about eight minutes of the game, and then a long scoreless stretch where neither team could get it in the back of the net, and then seeing you kind of pulled away late in the first half. So h- how important was, and at halftime, Dan talked to you, and, and you said draw control was a, a big key. How important was that in that first half of play? The draw control sets the tone for the entire game. I think um, the first half it was 14-6 and the draw controls were 14-7. Yep. So it's pretty easy to kind of see who and when that can happen um, to get the ball on our end of the field. I think that there's a lot of stuff that um, we still need to work on in the draw. We have all three new people out there um, that we didn't have last year. So I think trying to work through that and finding some other options in there that when w- our middies get tired, who we can put in and um, fill those spots a little bit. But I think a lot of things come back to it's not just the draw control, but going back that long scoreless stretch there. Um, when we get the ball on our attacking end, we just can't make silly mistakes and we need to hold on to that possession and make sure that each possession counts, especially when we are having a tough time against the draw controls. Um, so I think think now we just have brought that to their attention and they realize what a team effort it really is so that we can every possession counts um, and I think that that's really going to help us. Your team has been able to find some success offensively and this has happened in several games where you get uh, several goals you force an adjustment the other team adjusts and then your team has a little bit of trouble with the adjustment so how, how, how much of a challenge is that to tweak what you're doing in game after what you have been doing has has been working so well uh, we try to prepare as much as possible the week before we watch a lot of film and we try to get, say this might be a couple Um, different options that they might run on defense and so we try to prepare for those and have our defense run them at practice as best as possible Um, again we can never prepare 100 percent and going in we never know what they're really going to do so we had prepared um, for a couple and when we started off and saw what defense CNU was in in the beginning it was exciting for us because we hadn't had a chance to run this play before and it worked seamlessly Um, it was so easy and that's why I think the goals went back and forth for forever and then as they switched and changed it became more of like a panic attack on our end of like how now what do we do or do we go back to this or and trying to get that communication from the sideline onto the field is a little difficult at times given you only have three timeouts yeah Um, and to only have a couple of seconds to really get your point across sometimes people are still tired and they're not listening 100% and so it really is comes back to that leadership that's on the field and so that's something that we talked to Morgan about a lot yesterday and I think that she's ready now to take some of that ownership and be able to make some of those calls and adjustments that are needed um, when we can't do it on the sideline we talked to I'm thinking about Lynchburg or Susquehanna where in the in the second half your team even down by, by a large margin was able to, to battle back and, and I'm thinking about the three goals at the end by Coleman in one of those games. Uh, were you expecting a little bit more out of your team in, in say the second half against seeing you outscored 8-2 to two in, in that second 30 minutes? Um, I'm always expecting a lot more of them, I think, than they even realize. Um, And I think that we have the ability to do it. We talk a lot about spark. And so yesterday we kept saying on the sideline and our bench was so hyped up the whole game and they kept saying, be the spark, be the spark. And I think everyone has the idea of it in their head of, yes, that's great and we all need that. But it's, again, going back to not just talking about it and actually going out there and doing it and putting your actions into words. And so we now need some people that will step up and become that spark like Lindsay was that game. She was the spark Um, and I think when we get in stretches where they get goals back to back to back and we just haven't had an opportunity I think it becomes very difficult mentally more than physically of how do we become that spark and how do we get people to get back excited about this game and how do we make them think that we're still in it and so that's something um, mental wise that we have been working on over the spring break trip of trying to have some other people step up in ways that they might not know that they can do yet and finally Marymount this coming Saturday. You, you've got a whole week to prepare and, and rest up for that one. The CAC has four teams ranked in, in the top 25, and Marymount is in the same boat uh, as you guys where they need everyone they can get. They're not one of those ranked teams. What, what's the significance of this game in terms of a, a playoff picture? Last year you guys won at 19-14, and how do you relay that, that kind of importance to your squad? 
That I'm still trying to figure out myself. Um, it's kind of difficult to say a lot rides on this, and it's so important, and we need to win this game and not have your team kind of panic and stress out about it and forget everything that they know how to do. Um, so this week we started with last game and saying that it starts now, and it is every game. It's not just Marymount. Things mm-hmm. could happen a lot of other ways. Um, Marymount, if we even win that game, they could beat somebody else, and then that puts us in a tie. Like There's just so many factors that go into it, and so we can't just put all that emphasis on one game when I think we really need to spread it out and say every game is a possibility to have a win and I think that if we can keep clawing our way and figuring that out on our end I think that that won't put as much pressure for this next week Um, I'm glad we have a week I think it's exciting that we've been away for a while and we kind of learned a lot in the beginning with the win and the end with the loss and I think that now to have a whole week to prepare for a game that is important I think that it'll give them a little bit more reassurance that we're on the same page with it so well, we're looking forward to it. Women's Lacrosse Conference play continues. Looking for that first win. Marymount on Saturday. Haley Weir, thank you for joining me on the Bobcast. Thank you. Up next on the Bobcast, I'm joined by track and field head coach Dale Louie. Track and field opened its outdoor season. Had a, a slew of winners on the men's side, uh, several winners on the women's side as well. Uh, James Nail in the javelin, Philip Hogan in the steeplechase, John Kearns with the hammer throw, Braxton Clark, 5,000 meters, and the 4x4 relay of Charles Rickards, Terry in Washington on the men's side, Zoe Harris in the javelin, and Kylene Estrada in the 400 hurdles on the women's side. So, Coach, by and large, what did you make of the outdoor season opener? Cold. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, We were happy to get get a meet in. As you know, we were supposed to be up at Juniata, and, and that got canceled because of snow up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we were fortunate in finding another, you know, another meet to go to because uh, we really needed that because we not had a chance really to get outside very much. And and uh, so uh, you know it was it was a good good uh, uh, you know good practice meet so to speak. You know we we took it seriously, but uh, at the same time you got to put things in perspective too. Didn't necessarily bring the the whole crew on this one. Um, what what people ended up did coming, and and what were the reasons behind who co- who came and and who was off this week? Well, we were on spring break, and and we pretty much uh, you know said if you weren't going to be here for practice for the week, you weren't competing on the weekend. Sure, uh, you know so simple simple little rule there. Uh, and then we've had some people with uh, you know some aches and pains, uh, you know hamstring some hamstring issues. Uh, you know, if this was championship weekend, uh, some, of those, <laughs> some of those people would have been, you know, sure. ready to go and stuff, but it's just not, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, you know, at this stage to push it and, and, you know, with the, the, uh, cold temperatures, it doesn't make it, you know, very smart to do either. How much of a role does the weather play, um, in your outdoor season at this stage of the year? How common is that for you with, uh, the climate we have here in, in Western Maryland? Yeah. Our people, you know, have really... Uh, you know, starting a, a long time back when I when I got here, we we pretty much, you know, adopted the attitude that you know we're going to go out and practice as much as we can, uh, because we can get more done out there than we can inside. So, uh, and the people have adapted to that, you know, well, uh, you know, especially the upperclassmen, they expect it. And and quite honestly, I I truly believe that there are some meets uh, where the weather is not so great. That, that we do perform better than some of these other schools. Sure. Uh, the conference uh, outdoor championship second day last year was miserable, and we had a pretty darn good second day. And, and I just think it's because our folks are like, you know what, we're out here, we're competing, we're used to, you know, whatever comes our way, that, that's what we deal with. So it, it's a mindset, obviously, and, and we try to promote it, and I give our folks, uh, you know, a lot of credit for – for understanding what we're trying to accomplish there. Uh, and, and this weekend was just another example of, you know, of that. What do you make of, of the numbers, the results? Are they, are they really important to you this early in the season, seeing, or is this sort of like a baseline <laughs> for everyone? How do you uh, interpret that? Uh, this year in particular, a baseline, you know, very, and I'm not even sure a baseline, you know, because, you know, take, for example, our throwers, uh, you know, they, they really haven't gone outside and, and, uh, uh Two or three times they've been out throwing a javelin, sure. throwing a hammer, and stuff like that. So, uh, uh, you know, what you worry about sometimes is them getting in the meat and, and, and maybe getting hurt, you know, doing doing something. So we're always a little cautious with, with that. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, there was, like I said, a good chance to get out there and, and do something. The weather cooperated pretty well. And, 
And, uh, you know, we do have a baseline now. Uh, it's always a, a little tough transitioning from indoors to outdoors. Uh, you know, you get some events sometimes like the pole vault where you're actually going to, you know, do better in, inside. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon to see people with their PRs inside versus sure. out, outside. Uh, and it really doesn't matter sometimes where you are in the country, but sometimes you see that. It's just, you know, no wind, uh, you know, stuff like that. Interesting. And I want to get into that because several several of your wins, javelin, hammer throw, uh, hurdles, that they're different inside to outside, that they're exclusive to one or the other. So would, would you say your, your roster is more suited for one or the other? Or, and how has that transition been for a lot of your athletes that are, are doing, you know, shorter sprints inside versus outside and different kinds of hurdles and yeah, that sort of yeah. thing? Uh, most years, our, our team is probably more uh, – capable of scoring more points and being more competitive outdoors than indoors that makes sense uh you know some of that has to do with our depth uh you know in in, in a lot of our events uh you can you can sometimes indoors uh get away with there, there's a few fewer events indoors so you know if you have a smaller team and quality team sometimes you can get away with that when you hit outdoors uh you tend to have more trials and finals at some places you know so you're not going to maybe you know, quadruple or triple somebody the way mm -hmm. you might inside. So, we, so we, you know, typically are you know a better outdoor team than than indoors. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a throwing group that is uh, you know multi talented. Uh, you know, we have been for a number of years now, and uh, you know, people do more than one event. Again, that's not something you see at all schools. Mm -hmm. So there are more throwing events outside. So. Uh, you know that that plays into you know into our favor as well. And and without having an indoor facility, it makes sense that that being able to practice outside makes it better for for outside. How much can you improve, or can individual athletes improve over the course of the the outdoor season, especially once the weather starts getting better? Uh, quite a bit. I mean, the stars need to align. Uh, yeah. You know, because uh, you know, take for example, you know, distance. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll see their better outdoor performances, uh, you know, mid-season. Uh, they've made the transition outside. The weather's cooperating. Uh, it's not gotten too hot yet. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's very difficult sometimes for uh, particularly the longer distance people, your 5Ks, your your 10Ks, uh, to, to sometimes get season best late in the outdoor season because it, it, it almost becomes too hot, you know, sure. for them. and. And, uh, you know, there again, it kind of depends on, on where you're, uh, you know, where you're competing. Do you run into to overall, especially with those distance guys or, and, and gals, for those who went from cross country to indoor track to outdoor track, do, do you ever see that? And how do you sort of battle that fatigue and, and wear and tear over the course of, of all the athletes that, that we run into here, that they're in season virtually all year round? They, they are, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we're very conscious of that. Uh, so, I mean, we've, we do two things really, you know, one is, uh, we have tried to vary our workouts. Uh, for example, when we have access to the swimming pool, we try to use the swimming pool. Uh, we, uh, we'll use aerobic equipment, you know, when, when that is available to us. Uh, and, uh, we will, uh, we're obviously lifting weights. Uh, we'll do some circuit training with them. Uh, we do give them a little bit of a break after the cross country season. You know, we uh, we we basically say, hey, you know, you got two weeks here to yourself. We're not telling you to do anything. Uh, you know, if you want to go out and do something, that's fine. But we're not telling you what to do. You don't have to listen to the coaches. Uh, you know, because a lot of times it's, it's uh, although there's a physical side to to that length of season, uh, it's almost more of a, a mental side that that you have to kind of deal with there. Uh, you know, so our training varies too. You know, when we come back and start that indoor season with the distance people, you know, we're back to worrying a little bit more about their volume versus, you know, the, the quality of their effort there. Uh, and now as we get into the, you know, outdoor track season, you know, we start to, you know, we start to worry a little bit about the, the quality and stuff. Finally, we're looking ahead to this weekend, the Jim Taylor at, at Susquehanna University. Uh, you've been to SU quite a bit um, before. Uh, what what do you expect in terms of, of the squad you're going to bring up there? And then are you looking for another kind of, of baseline day, especially for those who didn't compete uh, in this past meet? 
uh, we, we should be pick, uh, taking up a, a full squad, uh, you know, uh, minus uh, anybody that might be injured or whatever. Uh, you know, hopefully we're, we're making some good progress there. Uh, and uh, the competition should be very good. Uh, they have a Mondo track up there, uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, optimum track. Uh, meet's supposed to be a little bit smaller than some other years because it's Easter weekend. Uh, but the teams that are on tap there are, are, are very good. So uh, if the weather cooperates, we'll have a little bit better of, of a baseline idea there uh, than we got, you know, this past weekend. But uh, for the people who competed this past weekend, uh, it should be, uh, you know, a nice measuring stick for them, you know, just to see, all right, how, how have I done now, you know, with the, with the week of outdoor season underneath sure. the belt. Well, we're looking forward to, to getting those results. Hopefully the weather cooperates. Uh, Coach Dale Louie, thank you for joining us in the Bobcast. Thank you very much. Back on the Bobcast here with head coach Guy Robertson of the baseball team. FSU baseball began its conference slate against Marymount, a 2 nothing loss in a low-scoring game on Friday. Played Gallaudet on Sunday, a 10-8 win in that one. And Coach really... This week, Frostburg bursts into the top 10, uh, according to according to D3 Baseball. And we've seen a couple of games this year. Uh, uh, Pitt-Greensburg comes to mind, and the Marymount game comes to mind, where this team was kind of out of the radar or off the radar completely preseason in a national sense. A couple of nice wins, some buzz, a fancy little number next to your name on, on all the press releases. And now teams... Teams seem to be after you in terms of shuffling their starters. Uh, Marymount starter pitched by far his best game of the season against you guys in the conference opener. What have you seen from opponents, and how has your team handled that, and how does your team need to handle that? Well, I think that having the target on our back again has or should renew your focus, your, your drive, and your want to prepare for each game knowing that you're going to get everybody's best that they have to offer. That's obviously been the case in the past. I'm, I'm not sure that it wasn't early in the season because you have so few games, teams are going to run out what they think is their best guy against their best opponent. And in some cases o over the course of those weekends where we played Abingdon and Stevenson, Stevenson has a pretty good idea of what they're going to get against us and Abingdon. They've played a lot in the past. Um, we've played uh, Stevenson a lot in the past. And you move forward in some of those other weekends where you're getting the new Rochelle and a Rutgers Newark at the same time. Rutgers Newark clearly knows that Frostburg is going to be their toughest opponent. And then on into the future. We saw it, though, with Elmira and Eastern holding their guys. Obviously, Shenandoah threw their number one guy. Yes, they did. Uh, Greensburg did not. They threw a bunch of guys, and they had success, but it really didn't have anything to do with their pitching against us that really allowed them to win. So, uh, Marymount knows, and we've had a great rivalry over the course of their time being in our conference. So, Marymount knows that they have to come to play, but we also know that as well, and I don't think it has anything to do with the pitching matchups, even though you had a tremendous pitching matchup yeah. in Brady against Bazemore. We face Bazemore. It seems like every game he's pitched in conference against us, he's been the guy standing out there. So it wasn't as if we didn't know what to expect out of him. The game that he threw was exactly the same game that he pitched against us down there last year where he threw a ton of fastballs was able to beat us with a ton of fastballs and not have to do a whole lot else because we weren't able to, to do anything against them and make any adjustments and force him to do something different, so why change? The kid's a competitor. He's been fantastic for that program. He's been a cornerstone of that program, and I give him a ton of credit, and I told him that after the game, that I'll be happy to see him go away because they're going away either way. He's a senior, and they're leaving the league. So uh, one way, any way you spin it, we don't have to face that guy a whole, whole lot more, and I'll be happy to see him go because he's kind of been our kryptonite. But to that point, we've now got to change our focus and how we go about it. And we talked about it yesterday at the end of the game, and I was pretty passionate about how I spoke to the guys at the end of the game yesterday, that it shouldn't take what we went through at the end of the game yesterday to get you excited. 
the fact that we got beat two to nothing and only had two hits in our first conference opener should have you come into the ballpark chomping at the bit to get better, to prove differently, and to go out there and dictate what's going on against an inferior team in Gallaudet. And we didn't do that. Just kind of went through the motions until uh, the eighth inning occurred. And then all of a sudden we started to get some energy and some excitement. But it was because our backs were against the wall. Well, you can't play with your backs against the wall every single time. And you also can't do it against good teams. You might be able to get away with it against the Gallaudet or some opponents of that ilk. But when you get into this league and you're trying to fight out of the corner every time against in the CAC, you're not going to win that battle. So I think that it's got to be something where we need to come out and we need to understand that we're going to get everybody's best shot. We've earned the right, as I said last week, to get everybody's best shot, to have that target on your back. Embrace it and understand that you need to go out there and you need to play baseball the way that we're capable of playing baseball and not ride the wave, so to speak, the ups and downs of the game. Mm -hmm. Just go out there and be consistent on a high level. There's been a lot of adversity for your team that hasn't really been in your control, whether that's the injuries that, the, that you've had, the weather that you had over spring break. It, it snowed like crazy for two days. Uh, your, your opponent's really getting after it. It was the Mary Pound game. They scratched two one, runs, and, and that was enough. How has that ad- adversity really benefited your team, or does it? what does your team need to do to, to respond to that adversity? I think we need to get healthy first and foremost. Sure. At this level, we have depth, and we talked about this, but we've been banged around and banged around pretty good where, you know, the depth's even becoming a little bit of a question. So we need to be healthy, first and foremost, and the guys need to do what they need to do to take care of themselves. When we are at 100%, we're tough and hard to deal with. When we're not at 100%, then I think it puts guys in positions that they haven't shown to be successful in or we can't put our best foot forward. And – We have tried all year long to make sure that we can put guys in a position to be successful up and down the lineup, not put them in positions that we've seen in the past that maybe they haven't succeeded in, and whether that's you know having to start and you're more suited to be a reliever, whether that's a guy that needs to hit down in the order who shouldn't be hitting in the middle of the order, things like that. So getting healthy is going to help us go a long way, and we got one back yesterday, and Nick Furman, and and that he looked fantastic, so it was great to have him back. At the same time, we had another one go down, and it's just been – I think it's been hard. And you get this weather, you're not able to be outside consistently, at least playing games because we haven't been outside anyways for practice purposes. Nope. So the at-bats are inconsistent. The type of pitching you've seen has been inconsistent. So we, we kind of face, you know, some highs and some lows just in the competition level. And unfortunately, we've we played much better baseball against the higher-level competition, which is a good thing. But you need to play that way all the time because you're the high level and make everybody play up to you instead of you just going, you know, bobbering up and down depending on who's on the slate that day. So I think getting some consistency, being able to play some midweek games, honestly, are going to help our hitters out. Being able to go out and do things against good teams, which are all coming up here as we move forward, uh, you're not going to face anybody that's really, uh, you know, below 500 or at least significantly below 500. Everybody's going to be able to challenge you. So we need to go out and, and I think just being able to play on a consistent basis and not this on again, off again, you know, weekly thing and then back inside and then play for a couple of games and then back inside. Being able to at least be outside for games and getting our, our pitching pitchers set up in, in positions to do what they can do and allowing our hitters to go out and get opportunities, um, whether that's in infield, outfield, whether that's in batting practice to keep some of the reserves ready. Just that consistency of being out on a baseball field doing baseball-like things instead of the on-again, off-again stuff um, and being healthy and being able to put our guys out there that, that we believe are our best contributors, but also being able to keep the guys that are the reserve guys ready to go as well. And they've had a lot of opportunities. So that's a good thing, I think, for the long term. But I think it's led to some of the short-term struggles that we've had here over the last seven days. Sure, and you want to look at the win over Gallaudet. Uh, Ward, Cardone, Rizik, Livingston all got innings. Uh, you, you picked up the win. Uh, I do want to, and Dan Richardson also in the, in the first game, uh, what did you see from your staff as a whole over the weekend? I saw really some flashes of brilliance. There was also some flashes of some of the same, same stuff out of some of the same guys that we've been looking to, to kind of elevate their game. 
Livingston's been tremendous all year. Richardson's been tremendous all year. Marco has been pretty darn good in his opportunities, but they've been too spread out, and that wasn't what we wanted to do for him. That's why we gave him the ball yesterday because it's been a while since he's pitched, Mm -hmm. uh, almost two weeks, I think. So we wanted to get some guys going, but it wasn't necessarily the pitching that was the problem. We make some some mistakes on the mound defensively, both against Marymount and against Gallaudet that lead to opportunities for them to score. And when you're not a punch-out, strikeout guy like Dan Rizek's not, you can't walk guys and give them extra opportunities when we have outs in our hands. That also goes for our defense as well. Brady, Greg can get out of their own way a little bit because they can strike out some guys, in, you know, to offset some of the mistakes where these other guys, when the balls were put in play as much, you got to play clean behind them, but it also means they got to do their job as well because when the ball leaves their hands, they become a defender too. And we've made some significant mistakes on the mound, whether that's been tipping balls that were double play balls, you know, would have gone to our middle infielders that end up being infield hits or throwing balls away that have been comebackers. Uh, that's been a problem. And that's one of the things that can improve once you get outside. Absolutely. You, you can't continue to try to simulate those things in a gym. Uh, they're coming at you different. They're bouncing different. The throws are different. Uh, you need to do those things on a field, no question. So, yeah, that's the part of the inconsistencies that we've had to deal with and some of the ups and downs you have to deal with. In general, I would say that we have seen a lot of good things out of a lot of different guys. We're just now needing to start to kind of piece those things together and get them going on a consistent basis. And I think once we can do that, you're going to see our game as a whole elevate significantly. I want to touch on some of those back-end back end guys in the bullpen. Mike Livingston, uh, in the ninth against Gallaudet, had to get his third out three different times, and I was impressed that he was able to, to stay calm and collected. The, the tying run was in scoring position. He gets out of it. For a sophomore to be in that role in, in the back end of the bullpen, he is saves against Cortland and Shenandoah. This is his first year here. How has he really gotten himself into that position and then thrived in that role? Yeah, it's just a matter of his mental makeup. He's built to do those types of things. He's really a cool customer. We saw that in the fall. We put him in some spots then. We were able to see him do some things against the place that he left in Potomac State in, the, in our fall scrimmage. So he's just built to, to take the baseball because nothing really bothers him. He's going to go about his business the same way. And I think that even though he's a sophomore, he's a model for what some of these older guys need to look to. And even some of our hitters, they can see, you know, hey, he doesn't hit you know the high highs or the low lows. He's just kind of even keeled. And we have some other guys who are a little more too emotional about things, whether it's on the mound or whether it's in the batter's box, just need to relax and let the game come to them a little bit more and do what you can do, and you can't control everything. And I think Mike controls what he can control at a very high level, and then he just needs some help. And um, we made a couple mistakes there, and just ridiculous mistakes there in the ninth. I mean, I think he threw about five pitches to get the first two outs, and you feel like, hey, they're going to go away. And next thing you know, you know, you don't – you get a catcher's interference, and you don't feel the ground ball to end the game. And the catcher's interference ends up being a ground ball that would have ended the game. And mm-hmm. So anything, all of a sudden some craziness happens, and all the things get out of Kelter. And next thing you know, our, you, we get through it, but it feels like you just went through a 15-round fight, and you thought it should have been a, you know, a TKO in the ninth round, and it just wasn't. So – But I think Mike has been tremendous. He just goes about his business the same way every day. He's prepared to take the ball. He'll take the ball for as long as you want to let him keep it. And he hasn't given us any reason to take it away from him. So I'm thankful for that. It's been a real solidifying force in the back end of the bullpen. I think it's put some other guys, who are relievers, in positions that be successful, that they don't have to carry the load um, in the more stressful moments at the end of games because he just seems to have a knack for it. And I'm glad he's on our side. And, and you've seen it pay off before having a guy in the back end. Uh, I went back and looked at uh, Nick Huff and, and you guys' run through regionals and World Series, five appearances, four saves, and a win. You, you need those kind of guys uh, to get where you want to go. 100%. And there's a lot of what I see in Mike that I saw in Nick, which was one of the reasons that we felt like Mike was capable of this type of role. Sure. Um, relentless competitor, but wasn't always didn't always show it. He wasn't wearing that emotion on his sleeve. Nick wore it a little more on his sleeve than Mike does. Mm -hmm. But you know what you're going to get out of them every time they take the ball, and that's hugely important. Absolutely. This week, Southern Virginia is scheduled for Wednesday. We'll see about that. But the big one, Salisbury on Saturday, Marietta uh, today, Monday. So 
some big games. Marietta's a ranked team. Salisbury, that's a huge game for conference play. It, I know it's been tough playing weekend to weekend. It, it's nice to get a Monday game here with, with Marietta. What are you looking for out of your team? How do you, how do you expect this week to go? I think it was really important that we played today. We were supposed to play them tomorrow, and the weather looks terrible. So yeah. I, it was important to be able to figure out how to play today, especially coming off yesterday. So I'm, I'm curious to see what kind of energy and focus we get for nine innings today. The fact that we were able to move it to today is, is probably equally as important just to be able to play and get some of that consistency. To me, the real important game is Wednesday. You don't want to go down 0-2 in the conference. You certainly uh, continue to hoe the road on the road, and I think that's important. But to get the first win in the conference, to get not that there's a monkey on our back, but we don't want to go into Salisbury 0-2. You also have to recognize that, hey, this team's playing pretty good baseball also. And they, they beat just, Roanoke already this year. They just And they just split with, with Salisbury. Mm -hmm. So you just want to make sure that you, you keep your nose in the mix here. And we have a lot of makeups and we have a lot of games in a short amount of time between today and next Monday. Um, we'll play, let's see, four, six games in seven or eight days, I guess. So you, you have a lot of baseball in front of you. So – Today and Wednesday, I think, just set up the weekend and the extended weekend, uh, the holiday weekend. Just about getting us going in conference, getting that, that ball rolling for us and feeling like we could be a factor in the conference. I mean, clearly we think we should be, but you got to go out and do it. And Wednesday will be one of those days where we have another opportunity to, to put our best foot forward and have a chance to prove that we belong in the conference mix. And that's really what we have to start focusing on. All these rankings and this window dressing and all that other crap is just that. It's just some fancy way to saying that you've gotten off to a good start and you've beat some good teams and what have you. But we've got to take care of business now moving forward. And all that stuff is absolutely behind us. It, it should be. Uh, I don't know if over the last week we start to smell ourselves a little bit and think we're better than we really are. Uh, you got to be blue collar in this game. You got to be able to roll up your sleeves, and you got to be able to take some punches, and you got to be able to fight back. And yesterday, for at least one inning, we rolled up our sleeves and we fought back, even though we were put into a corner. And that's really, I think, what we need to see now. We're going to take some great shots. We're going to take everybody's great best punch, and we got to be able to come out and we got to be able to fight through some adversity that are some of our own doings and some of these injuries and some of the weather. And we just got to keep on battling. And if we do that, then I think our talent will stand, you know, shine through and we'll be, get more consistent play out of more guys in our lineup. The bullpen stuff will start to come together. And you'll start feeling that sense of camaraderie and, and just that excitement again, which for whatever reason over the last week or 10 days, we've seen the lose a little bit. So we need to polish this thing up and we need to get back on and, and, and just, you know, start going. And we've been punched a little bit and we've been bucked a little bit, but we'll be better off for it. And now it's just time to go play baseball. And hopefully it's one of those things where we can continue to, to get games consistently, be able to run our best guys out there, stay healthy. And if we do that, then I like our chances to win more games than we're going to lose. And at the end of the season, uh, I think we'll be in the mix. So just kind of got to get going here and get out of our own way. And uh, I think for sure that uh, the best is yet to come. Baseball looking for its first conference win this week. Coach, thanks for your time. Thank you.